Hello and good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from Livestream.travel here in Honolulu, Hawaii. With me is Dr. Peter Talo, joining from College Station in Texas. Um, Peter has been our co-host from the very beginning for this daily update on relevant news um, interfering with the world of travel and tourism today. Good afternoon, Peter. How's everything in Texas? Well, we're doing much better. We had a little bit of a snowstorm a few days ago, but it's gone now and we're coming back to good weather. So it's good to speak to you. I'm not quite as jealous of Hawaii as I have been the last few days. We're talking about snowstorms. Um, right now, the city of Madrid and literally all of Spain um, is going through the worst weather uh, anyone uh, can think of. In Madrid, it was less than minus 20 uh, Celsius today, Yes, what is a record. And uh, minus 30 uh, Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit, it's really, yes. It's and, really cold. Right, and it's it's very hard. In, in Madrid, healthcare workers have been seen walking for hours because there's no more bus service right now and subway service also because of Corona, walking um, home and to the hospitals so they can relieve their colleagues that are exhausted because Madrid also had more than 30,000, 24,000 more Corona cases today with almost 500 people dying. So wow. there is a double disaster. And that adds actually to the challenge the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization has. Um, currently, uh, the election is posted, is uh, set for two, Monday and Tuesday next week. And this is not an immediate election. It's That's an election incredible. for 2022. It does so. It's, there's no need at all to have this in a year in advance. Again, let's take a step back. Some people may not know what the UNWTO is. So let's take a step back and just explain the importance of this election and why, uh, how this impacts the world of tourism. Because I think a yeah. lot of you know it and I know it, but lots of people don't know it. No, and, and, and as I said, the UNWTO stands for United Nations World Tourism Organization. It's the organization entrusted on the UN level, and it's a special agency of the United Nations, um, with a little bit more than 150 some members, countries, members are countries in the world, working together in travel and tourism. We have to say that the United States and also the United Kingdom are not members of UNWTO, uh, but uh, there, but most of the there, world is. Uh, but most of the world is, and it's um, under the tr um, Obama administration, uh, the uh, United States almost joined. So this may happen now under the new Biden administration again. But the election is very important because it's about the person in charge of this agency and of world tourism. And as, of course, everyone knows on this platform, we in the travel and tourism industry are going through the worst crisis ever. And it's important yeah. to have capable people running this organization. So That's now this election for the 2022 to 2026 period is up for next week. Um, there had been um, an initiative actually by our World Tourism Network spearheaded by Dr. Taleb Riffa, who was the secretary general for two terms and by um, Mr. Vranjali, who was the Secretary General the previous terms before Taleb. In addition to this, also endorsed by Professor Jeffrey Lippmann, who was the Assistant Secretary General, and by Carlos Vergler, who was the second man in the UNWTO under Taleb Rifai, all urging the current Secretary General, Mr. Zurab, and I'm sorry I cannot pronounce his last name, from, yeah. he's from the yeah, Republic of... That's really all that matters. Yeah, from right. the Republic of Georgia uh, right. to agree a postponement of this process. But he is, disagrees. And the bad part is we're all on a Zoom world. So it should be easy to say, OK, let's have this election virtually. But um, Mr. Zorab insisted, um, and there is some kind of a stature in the UNWTO, that this election has to be done in person. So people actually, ministers of tourism are expected to travel to Madrid. So, so, the, so this is really the hard part, is that one, they can't get to Madrid because the airport's close. Two, they could get to Madrid, they couldn't get out of their hotel. The country, it's 25 below uh, zero. It's um, uh, over a meter, over two to three feet of snow have now fallen in, in Madrid. 
And in the middle of this, we're having an election that's not necessary. And that really impacts tourism because it, interfe it, it, it impacts the relations between the tourism industry and the airline industry and the travel industry and the cruise industry. And so it seems like a very esoteric topic at first you're bringing, but in reality, this touches every part of the uh, UN and how it impacts tourism, especially in those countries that are developing tourism, such as in Asia or in Africa that really need the help of the United Nations. So well, I'm, very well taken. I mean, the entire reason behind is it's not that UNWTO will be without leadership, but it's about a re-election for the second term for the current right. Secretary General Zurab. He doesn't want competition, obviously. He hates competition. And uh, he didn't expect anyone would actually be able to sign up because after they made this decision to move the um, election from May to January, he didn't expect anyone was f have the deadline um, could and apply for it to uh, to November of last year. Seven countries actually tried; only one was accepted. Six of them made minor mistakes, and the secretariat secretariat of the UNWTO kicked those people out. I know one was a very angry gentleman from uh, Senegal. Uh, who is now uh, raising his voice and said he should have been accepted. But the only one who actually made it was from Bahrain. This is Her Excellency Mai Al Khalifa. She was or is the current Minister of uh, Culture in Bahrain. And she has been trying very hard to campaign. She actually is in Madrid. And I had a chance to talk to her assistant this morning. She's devastated because she doesn't have winter clothes and all the shops are closed in Madrid because of Corona. But uh, the main she problem- <laughs> She's in a hotel, but she can't get out of the hotel. Well, apparently she's trying. She came there on the private jet. Um, I guess the government uh, from Bahrain paid for a private jet to get her to Madrid. And uh, she has been visiting embassies because embassies are allowed to vote uh, and send their ambassadors physically. Um, but unfortunately not every country out of the 35 countries that are voting, these are the executive council members have embassies in Madrid. So there are few countries with embassies and uh, the um, Sheikha apparently visited these embassies um, in the last few days when she managed to get to them, maybe walking for hours. I don't know how to how she did it or maybe take a sled. But uh, but today we got a little bit of good news and I really honestly feel sorry for her. Um, not even talking about her qualifications that I'm sure there are there, uh, but also about what she has to go through. She seems to be a very strong woman and she's actually the first woman running for secretary general. Uh, but I, I have to say, I, I felt quite um, relieved when uh, her campaign told me today that they actually fear they have the majority of the countries. And uh, so this is good news. If they have the majority of the countries that can get to the election and vote, it's a good sign because I think no matter what you think, how qualified or not qualified a candidate is, if someone can push for such a fraud in a re-election, he or she shouldn't be in charge. And this is really what Zorab has been doing. He's been pushing not to move this election so he can no, win. I think the real issue is we're talking about, just like there was a big issue in the United States, you shouldn't have censorship. People should be able to get their point out. You may agree with the point or you may disagree with the point, but you should be able to know the point. And that's an issue that I think is really gonna be important around the world, not only in tourism, but in everything we do. And if people are censored, if they're unable to say what they believe, then we have some really major problems around the world. Some of the worst problems since the 1940s. So I think you're really hitting a, a very important level. Tourism cannot succeed if we have censorship. Tourism needs a free flow of information and a free flow of people. No, absolutely, Peter, I, I agree with you. and. I have to admit, no matter where you stand in the current really dangerous uh, situation we're going through in our own country and, uh, and how you stand in, in regards to our current president, it has nothing to do, we should not stop Thank people you. from uh, saying what they wanted to say. Okay. I completely disagree for Twitter, Facebook, and 
Amazon to cut people off from their network because they're saying something they may not like. However, where do we where do we define the borders on this? If you go to Twitter and say, can you help me to kill this person? Is this a message you should be able to say? Of course. And what's really fascinating is that Twitter today lectured to the people of Uganda that they should not interfere in political campaigns and political elections when Twitter very much interferes with political campaigns. But maybe this will take us to the other topic we wanted to talk about. And that is not only the free flow of information, but also the free flow of people. And that leads to the whole question of, many of us are getting vaccinated. Yesterday, we talked about the fact that I had my first vaccine and I'm looking forward in the beginning of February getting my second uh, vaccination. And then 10, 12 days later, I should be able to travel where I wanna travel because I will have been vaccinated. The question is some countries will say, you can come in and some countries are going to say, without showing that you've been vaccinated, we don't want you to come in. And that's really an issue. Does a country have the right to say, without being vaccinated, you can't come in? What do you think? Because I think that's really an interesting concept we need to talk about a little bit. Well, I think a country should be able to determine this. A country has an obligation to its citizens. And I can see it here. I don't live in an independent country, but I live in the state, Hawaii, what is far away from the rest of our own country. So it's almost like an independent country. Yeah. I don't, honestly, as much as I love tourism, and I've been in this industry for 40 years and more, I don't want people to come in here um, that could be considered um, a threat a to our health to system. Threat to the health. Yes, I think there should be regulations. There should be exceptions to this regulation. So some people may not be able to get the shot. We cannot, we cannot not allow people who have health reasons or maybe small children that simply cannot get the shot not to be able to travel. But people who are healthy and could get the shot and simply don't want to get the shot, um, I'm, I'm, I, I think there is a, you know, there's a fine line. Yes, there is. And I think one of the ways that that could be handled is a lot of places, of course, have regulations. If you want to come in, you have to spend two weeks in quarantine. So if you want to travel and with the shot, be our guest. If you don't want to take the shot, of course, you have two options. One is stay home. But the other option is if you do travel to a place, then you have to spend two weeks in quarantine to make sure and have a negative test to make sure that you're okay. There's a lot of fear of this uh, vaccine. I'm not sure why, because it's not like say the smallpox vaccine many years ago when I was a child and they put a small amount of the disease into you to make you immune. This is just basically working with the proteins in your body. There's no COVID in the COVID vaccine. And so it's absolutely safe. Now, of course, the media has some parts of the media have made a big deal of it. One or two people have reactions. But I can tell you, I can give you an aspirin and you can have a negative reaction. But most people are not afraid to take an aspirin. And one of the big problems we have to deal with is showing people that millions of people now have had this vaccine and so few people have had a reaction. It's kind of like taking an aspirin. So yes, breathing takes a risk. Walking down the street is a risk. We cannot live in a risk-free society. And one of the risks we need to work on is not to be afraid to take this vaccine because it's going to make us all, give us herd immunity and make the world finally conquer COVID-19, which is something we desperately need to do. Yeah, Peter, of course, there is, there is an, another issue. Um, I know um, there is a discussion currently with Qantas Airlines, the airlines for Australia, yes. um, of, putting restrictions on passengers or not allowing passengers to board their flight without the vaccine. Now, the vaccine has been given to so few people. Um, I think it's really too early. Um, but then again, should we just mandate for people not to travel till they get the vaccine? Or should we say if a certain percentage were able to get the vaccine, we put these rules in place? How, how should we handle this? What do you think? Well, I think one of the things we can do is a lot of airlines won't let you get on without a negative test. So one of the things we could say is either you prove you've had the vaccine 
or immediately, and we now have testing that can be done almost before you get on an airline, that say within an hour or two hours, you have to take a test and um, show that you're uh, negative before you get on a plane. Because there's the ethical issue. If you get on a plane with COVID, you could get half the plane sick. And you know th that's not fair. So if you haven't been vaccinated, I think you have to prove you have a negative uh, test. Yeah, and, and, that, that, and that comes to uh, another piece of news. What came out is the mandate by the CDC that out of, I believe, January 26th, um, everyone arriving in the United States from a foreign country need to have a test within three days before arrival. That's kind of the same rule we had in place here for Hawaii since October 15th. I don't know why they it took this long to do it. The CDC should either. have done this three months ago. I mean, for, or no, or in uh, March of last year. I mean, it seems to me you don't have people come into your country who have an infectious disease and are going to get people sick. It seems to me this is a real failure on the part of the CDC that no one should be allowed in the United States or Canada or whatever country it is. Um, I couldn't go to Canada if I were um, uh, positive. I couldn't go to Canada without a COVID uh uh, vaccine, the United States should be doing the same. I don't know why we don't do it. it yeah, and then, then, of course, we're such a big country. Um, and I don't know how you think we should handle it for domestic flights into Hawaii. There is a rule it has been in place for a while. Um, what, should this rule be in place for flights from coast to coast to Alaska to Puerto Rico or wherever people wanted to go? My answer would be yes. My answer okay. is if you don't have if you if you don't have a negative test, you shouldn't be allowed to get on a plane, period. That simple. Because it's an enclosed space, you don't have your own space. If, if I'm in a car by myself, I'm not getting you sick. But we're sharing everything on a plane from the laboratories to um, people putting their mask on, not putting their mask on to eat, to uh, breathing air. I should not be put in an environment that's unsafe. And so it seems to me if you don't have, I think Emirates Airlines does the same, right? Um, that you have yes. to have a negative test in order to be able to get on the plane. And eat, if you don't either be vaccinated or get the test. If not, drive or don't go, you know, swim to Hawaii. <laughs> but, uh, and Hawaii won't let you in anyway without the test. So it, it makes sense to me. I think this is part of responsible travel. And that's really a key issue that I think for tourism to survive, it has to show it's responsible. Uh, Peter, I fully agree. We're over our time already. Okay, we, what are. we wanted to, but it was an interesting discussion. Lots going yeah, on in the world, and we do this right. again tomorrow. I but, look uh, forward to it. You have a good evening. Bye you bye. too. And anyone who wanted to see this after we stop broadcasting it uh, on Etobo News or live stream live, you can actually go to livestream.travel and uh, watch this one and also watch all the uh, different the videos we did uh, a few days ago. Thank you very much and uh, aloha and good night. Have a good evening, y'all. Bye-bye.